for completely forgot about it. Matter of fact, it was with my dad who pastors the uh, Favor Center in Kings Mountain, and he didn't even know about it till last night at dinner. And I know I'm getting old, so I'm getting old. Very excited. I met with archi the architect, uh, me and Richie did, and a lot of you don't know this maybe, but Richie has a uh, degree in engineering. Now he's uh, engineering the kingdom. Hallelujah. And uh, we've paid the land off, 21 and a half acres. It's debt free. <clears throat> When I was telling other pastors, uh, bishops, I'll, I'll be meeting Thursday and Friday with about 20-something churches in a fellowship in Macon, Georgia. And I, Monday night, I'll be on his uh, phone call talking to all the churches in, the, in North America connected to Bishop Ronnie Cotton. Uh, but I was talking to a, a man of God, and he said to me, he said, Bishop, I've been watching your services, and he says, I noticed that you're not embarrassed. You're not, you, you don't seem timid to talk about money, and you talk about time. He said, and there seems to be such a hostility right now with the people. And I said, well, brother, we walk in integrity with our money. We, we, we put it towards ministry, and we're taking care of churches. We take care of people. Now, we don't just go feed anybody, but we do make sure we take care of everybody connected to this house. And uh, I said, when you walk in integrity with something, you can talk about it more. So we're not ashamed to talk about tithe and offering and, and first fruits. And let me tell you why. Everything we have has come in from our willingness to trust God with the little we've got. And now we've got 21 acres debt free. I was talking to the uh, builder. So I met with the uh, architect. Then Friday at 11 o'clock, we met with, with uh, um, uh, Looper, uh, David Looper uh, Company. Uh, contractor, I couldn't think of who he was calling, contractor, and boy, he was get you know, questions decide success, and you ought to write that down, you, you can pray all you want, and shout all you want, and roll in the floor all you want, but if you don't learn to find right people and ask right questions, and the reason why some of you are still unsuccessful, and still broke, and still in poverty, and still in bad relationships, is because you won't find right people, you won't find, reach up to hire people, and ask questions, I'm sitting down this week with a multi multi-millionaire. I called his secretary and said, you, I know you know a lot about money. To, uh, schedule me. I got questions to ask about moving to the asking questions to a bank. Dr. Mike prophesied there'll be four businessmen that God's going to speak to that we're going to see supernatural debt free on this building. I'm about to show you up here on the screen. We got the building and, and, and the contract, uh, the architect came and gave us. Um, some preliminary drawings, and the preliminary drawings are coming up. This is, uh, this is first floor right here. This seats, these are all tables right here, and I love this, uh, right here, 408 people just with tables. Uh, I, it, the, he said if we did just chairs, we could probably almost seat five, 600 people. That's nuts, isn't it? You know what somebody asked me, said, are you running five or 600? I said, no, but you never move in your season where where you are, you move by your faith. Yeah. Amen. And, and in Hickory, uh, you know, we are kingdom church. I, you go to a lot of churches and get some good sermons, but you come here to get kingdom impartation. See? And so this is the sanctuary, and these are hallways. We're going to have two green rooms, one on each side. This stage is going to be huge, a lot bigger. Your ba the band, y'all going to love that. Y'all going to have, and, and singers, y'all have a little place over here, so y'all can hang out. I'll put a little refrigerator in there for you. How's that? Because y'all work so hard. The band, how many enjoyed the band today? <laughs> Hallelujah. They did a great job, man. I love watching Gift. And boy, did you preach back there. Did Jeremy preach back there or what? My God. Pastor, what y'all feeding these guys? Man, that dude got to preach on them. If you want anything alive, let God breathe on it. He's going to bring things that have been dead in you. Boy, I was, I was, see, y'all, y'all come here just to get through. I came here to get imparted, but I was, I started anything that I could think of that I thought. And here's what God said to me. You can call alive what you might have been killing, what I've been calling alive. Why don't you get out of my way and let me resurrect some things that you've been murdering in your own life? Here's something else I got from that. How do I know God's with me? Because when I inhaled, it's the proof he exhaled. Woo, hallelujah. You ought to write that down. I just gave you a $100 note right there. When I inhale, whew, God had to exhale. God said, you can't live if I ain't breathing because you are the breath of God. God breathed into man, and man became a living being. We'll talk about that in a minute. Daniel, it's good hearing your voice. 
We've been praying for you, man. Praying for you. In the name of Jesus, Daniel just had prostate surgery, and he's doing great. And he's in church, and he hasn't missed much church. Father, I pray for you right now that everything you're facing, life comes to your body in Jesus' name. Somebody lay hands on that brother right there. He's got his hands up. Father, I release the anointing of healing. I release the blood of Jesus Christ by your stripes. Our body is healed, and I love this. Uh, it said, lay hands on them, and they shall be recovered. God, we recover him where hell has tried to uncover him in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We're bottom ministry. We're crazy around here. Look, now, we're just crazy around here. So if you're watching, we're just nuts. But let me show you this little building right here. So this is going to be two double doors. You see this right here? Can you go and show this part right here? Did you blow that up, Daryl? Did they blow that? Oh, yeah, look at that. That's a, when you come in, it's going to be a nice drive under it. This is going to be a big Starbucks coffee shop right there. We're going to have Starbucks right there. We're going to have a Starbucks sign, for real, for real. We know as soon as we put a Starbucks sign, there will be lines right here. You don't come for Jesus, I know you'll come for Starbucks. Because I travel all over this country and all over the nations and world, and everywhere I go to Starbucks, there's a line. I, don't, I, I mean, it can be any time of day you go, there's a line. They put, they put drugs in that coffee, I'm telling you. It don't even taste that good. McDonald's coffee is cheaper. I will drive by McDonald's where they're giving away free coffee and go over here and pay $3 for, they must be cracking it or something, I don't know. But we're going to have this nice awning right here. This is going to be an open stairway. Actually, we may be even, uh, we was talking to the contractor, we might put in, build in an elevator shaft right there and then later put an elevator in. So, uh, well, we just see these bathrooms right here. Then we're going to come right here. Now, here's what changed. This whole room right here is going to be huge. And uh, it's, almost, it's almost the same size as downstairs right now with no poles in it. Hallelujah. <laughs> and then we got some bathrooms. And these are offices. You come in right here in the office area. And that th big room right there is the pastor's office. And this little room right here is my office. <laughs> Look at somebody say, but devil is a liar. Somebody said, why do you have to have such a big office? Because I'm not short. I'm concentrated. Somebody said, you're short. I said, I ain't short. I'm concentrated. Don't take a whole lot of me to get them something done. So this is all bottom level. This is, And then you go up these stairs, and then you'll go upstairs to another almost uh, 10,000 more square feet. And uh, you got that? Did they show that? We have that too? There, no, that's, that's sanctuary. But look how nice that's going to look. That's upstairs. Is that upstairs? Yes. And so if you come upstairs right here, you see this room right here? This is four, almost 4,000 square feet. It's twice the size of downstairs. Twice the size, man. And so we're going to have some classrooms up there, right here, some classrooms, bathrooms. And so it's going to be, that's going to be a little kitchenette there. And so uh, that's first phase right there. And I love what the contractor said. He sat down. He says, listen, I'm going to help you. I want to help you do this because I want project three, four, and five. I know you all ain't stop y'all ain't stopping right here. I said, oh no, we just started right there. <laughs> Amen. So how many believe that this is gonna be? Now listen, they said 3.4 million when they said it. I said, the devil's a liar. I know it ain't gonna take no 3.4 million. I believe it's gonna be under two million. How many believe we can get it done under two million? Doesn't matter what they say it's gonna cost. God is our our source. He's our Jehovah Jireh. Amen? And we've already done what we've done out of this church in thousands and international ministry because my seed decides my harvest, not your tithe. Hallelujah. And so, but I believe there's four businessmen that are going to get involved. Dr. Mike said that he believes that he's hearing God that that's going to be a debt-free project within the next 24 months. If it is, we go into phase two, ain't we? Amen? Well, hook somebody around you. Just say, I love when you see progress. I love progress. Amen. The Bible says in Samuel, I'm going to talk to you for the next 30, 40 minutes, get you out here so you can go get some brunch. I know you're tired. That I, how many feel like they're missing that hour of sleep? Let me tell you how bad it was for Bishop. Let me tell you. Pray for Bishop. Because I went to bed early thinking about that hour of sleep and got so panicked about it, couldn't sleep. Isn't that crazy? 
I was up at 6 o'clock. I said, Lord, I went to bed early so I could get me an hour of sleep. And he said, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You panicked. <laughs> the Bible says in Samuel that um, there's a scripture in there that is uh, very interesting to me. And, uh, and it's just in my head. And I, I, don't, I can't really tell you where it is. But when I start to quote it, somebody look it up and bring it up. It says that God was angry with the children because there were no blacksmiths found in the nation. Blacksmiths. And the word, um, uh, it's uh, Samuel, 1 Samuel uh, 13, uh, and it says, uh, verse, 10, verse uh, 19, Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords and spears. And uh, when I read this one time, the Lord said, um, when the enemy wants to bring you down, okay, when any enemy wants to defeat you, and they, now watch this, watch this, and they don't want to go to warfare in your future. They're going to find a way in your present or in your past to rob you of the comprehension to build weapons. The reason this is a good scripture is because blacksmiths knew how to, how to pound out iron and iron is the weapon of war. And when hell can get away from you, the willingness to learn how to build your weaponry for fighting. Look at somebody say, you got to fight. Everything's a fight. I don't care what you say. Your, your health, the warfare, my, new, my brand new book out, Warfare's You Must Win. Everything you want to increase will require warfare on your part. Everything. Say it. Everything. You're going to warfare over your children. You're going to have to be willing to warfare over your marriage. Your marriage needs attention. Your ma men need to raise up and start covering their houses and covering their wives. And know that you can't just get uh, relaxed and uh, lazy over any area that requires increase. Because if you do, the enemy is going to rob you of the excellence to build warfare for your future. And you'll end up dying in your present season. And, and so it's very important that you learn that how do I get the weapons necessary in the church? And I'm not talking about sermons. Sermons aren't helping anybody. Now, if you were not here Wednesday night, or you, you might have watched online and you, and you got it, get the CD on the way out because I'm going to hit these, these, this, this topic just real quick. But if you don't understand what we're talking about, what we've been singing about, blow, mighty wind of God, breath of God, and what all this means, it's not just to get your marriage healed. We're not just trying to get your, uh, your, get your life back on track, which we are. That is a focus. That's the beginning focus of every ministry. We do want to uh, help you overcome your failures and mistakes and, and things you did and things you shouldn't have done and, and want to get your dreams back. But the real power of the church is not that you gather here have an emotional high, but that someone starts turning back on your spiritual mind. Write this down. My mind must be turned back on. This is why the Bible says religious people are churchgoers. That's all they are. And they talk about church and they'll talk about what their church projects are. But kingdom people aren't so focused on a building or a property. They're more focused on a king, okay? And then they build the buildings and buy the properties not according to what they can do, but according to how they can exhort and, and, and decree the king is still alive. And so when we move to our new land, it's about the king. It's about the kingdom. And the kingdom, kingdom-minded people are about the king. Say this, the king. They're, they want to please the king. They want the king to notice them. That's why they want to hang in the court. David said, one day in your presence, uh, one translation says, one day in your courts uh, is better than a thousand elsewhere. One day of favor is worth a thousand days of labor. And you have your options. You have your choice. Uh, you can spend a thousand days trying to build it or you can take time to get into the presence and into the courtroom where the king will come and gather and in his presence he could say in a moment what it would take you a thousand days to do in your Hallelujah. This is why churches being attacked. Uh, the gathering, say gathering. 
the gatherings are the most, one of the most important things you'll ever learn. I'm going to show you here in a minute. I'm just kind of building some foundation in case you didn't get it. So the Bible says that, in, that there were no blacksmiths. There was nobody willing to learn how to build warfare or, we, or, or weaponry. And here you have a society right now, if you watch the news, Fox News, CNN News, all of it. If you watch the trend right now, if you're into trending, Twitter and Facebook, you're going to see there's a passivity in the church. We talk more about, we, you, ever, you ever see people liking things? There's a, uh, the comment, it says like, 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 like. Some, somebody, a 15-year-old posts, oh, I'm, I'm the, I just got pregnant, and they say I'm having a baby boy, and all the people start going like, 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 and comment, oh, congratulations. Congratulations on what? And what are you liking that a girl at 15 years old had got, got pregnant? I, now, I can talk like that because my daughter was pregnant out of wedlock, okay? My daughter was only 17, 18 years old. That didn't mean that, uh, that I have to hide it. No, we talk about it. Why? Because I told her to her face, you're out of line, you're out of order. Anytime you get out of the order of God, and out of the plan of God, you end up putting consequences in your life that God didn't schedule. Wrong decisions trigger the law of unintended consequence, okay? Consequences are a part of life. Galatians chapter 6, be ye not deceived. Whatsoever a man sow it, that shall he also reap. Because your neighbor say you reap what you so, and when you, you, cut, you get the cart before the horse, God set up a divine order. He set up a divine plan. And if you don't, I got a ring in here. Is there a little ring on me? It's a little ring. Did you test these this day? It's a little ring. Get monitors, but no ring. Got it? If you, if you monitor this understanding that you're going to become more, let me, let me say this, more vigilant in making a right stand and not just trying to be liked on Facebook. Amen. I think some of you have become so more focused on being liked by everybody on Facebook that you forgot that God's probably been unliking and unfollowing you for a while. <laughs> it's okay. You can laugh. <laughs> or cry. Or work the gift of repentance. <laughs> See, I don't have to feel, con I don't go to church and feel condemned because the minute they hit me, I say, God, I'm sorry, please forgive me. <laughs> and so we have to understand that we get so focused on the, the liking of men and the liking of people that we don't seek the, the, the pleasuring of God. But the Bible said, this is what David said, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he'll make even his enemies to be at peace with him. Hallelujah. And so we talked about this language recognition and the four things that's in the church and the reason why we're not experiencing manifestation like the Bible said we ought to experience. Uh, how many would like to see? How many of you in your lifetime, have, and, and some of you may, but, but by the majority, how many of you have ever seen a blind person be healed? Out of all of us, and I, I don't know how many, I think, think about one person seen it out of all of us. However, according to the, the gospel, he said, go lay hands on the sick. He said, look, he said, go, go out. He said, heal the sick. This is what Jesus said. Watch. This was the mandate of us as the church. He said, go out, not here. See, we all want to do it here. See, we're waiting to get healed here. God don't really need to heal you here because the healing was for the unbeliever. He said, go out. And this is what he said. Here's your mandate. Number one, heal the sick. That's what he said. He didn't say go out and pray for him. He said go heal him. He said raise the dead. Now, anybody, anybody raise the dead this week? Well, anybody heal anybody sick this week in the name of Jesus? Anybody? I mean, he prayed for him, but he said go heal the sick. Is it sounding okay, babe? I'll go to the hand. It sounds okay. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Hear what he said. Cast out demons. I have somebody tell me demons don't work, demons aren't uh, operational no more after the cross. Well, I said you ain't hanging around my life, because all them demons you say ain't operational, they all found my address. Matter of fact, as soon as God moves toward you, the proof of that will be the intensity of the demonic attack around you. Heal the sick, raise the dead. Cast out demons, freely you give, freely you shall receive. 
Do you realize that this freely you give, freely you have received, freely what? Give. But here's what the church has is, is, is become institutionalized. And here's what we've done. We want to keep everything from the leader. And, and we don't want our parents to know about it. We don't want to offend our friends. Let them know we don't want them to offend us. Right? Do we offend you? Man, that's full. <laughs> See, those that have had great attack and had great deliverance don't want to be quiet very long. <laughs> when you've come out of great warfare, there's great victories. Where there's great victories, there, am I right, Joe? There's great excitement when you know that you've come through like I've come through child molestation, but I'm still here. When you come through what I come through in ninth grade with, and bone specialist said you got cancer and said you're going to amputate your leg, but I still got two legs because uh, I had a praying daddy and a mama and my daddy got up on the edge of my bed and said, I don't care what a doctor says, uh, but I do care what God says. And my Bible says that by his stripes we are healed. And I got a 15-stitch scar where they went in and sewed it back up and couldn't find nothing. When you have great victories, you can't be silent. Matter of fact, what if I told you the volume of your praise would unlock the problem that's over your life? You gotta get excited. I've always been energetic. I was a youth pastor for a long time, and I scared the hell out of all the religious people. And I did it as a pride. I was pride. It made me happy to see them get up and walk off my aisle. I, 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 I used to sit down and tell people, beside me, now listen, they're going to start praise here in a minute. When they do, I'm going to jerk and buck and huck and shuck. and I might spin around. I might start jumping. If that bothers you, let's pick another pew. And anybody, don't be sending, I'm telling much, don't be sending people all on top of me. Y'all move over here a minute. Why? Because as soon as they say we're going to praise the king and I know what he delivered me from, I know that I'm dyslexic and shouldn't write a book, much less read them, and I've written 30. I've preached around the world on every major TV play. When I see what the goodness of God has done for me, I can't help but get excited and shout and scream and holler. Matter of fact, some of you right now, God's about to deliver you out of every snare and every trap only because you were willing to be different and get a little excited. Amen. 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 Hold on. We have to understand that God wants us to be. I saw this movie the other day, or I saw, a, 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 okay, I went to the movies, okay. I was going to try to get out of it. But I saw this movie the other day. It was called and uh, it was called John Wick, okay? I went to this movie, John Wick, okay? Did you see it? Somebody said, oh, yeah. Did you see John Wick? Yes, Bishop. I was repenting any time they said bad words. And so, for them, because I didn't say anything. <laughs> but there was a line in there when this guy, he's just really, a, he's just a bad guy. You know, he knows how to shoot people. And, I mean, he just, you know, you're going to mess with this guy, right? And here's what I got out of it. This is crazy. But I'm watching it, and he 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 had done some things, and the the big cartel guy. Now he's after the big cartel guy, right? The big drug guy, right? And his son had did something to him. He had robbed, he stole his car, and killed his dog. You don't kill a man's dog. You're going to get in trouble. I'm telling you. And his daddy was upset with his son, and he he was just really getting on to him. And his son looks at his daddy, and he says, "Well, daddy, is he the boogeyman?" That's what he said. What you so upset about? You act like he's the boogeyman. Now, you know what the boogeyman was, the monster that crawled up under your bed or in the closet, right? And here's what the dad said. I'm getting somewhere. Just bear with me. The dad looked at him and said, no, son, he's not the boogeyman. He's the guy you send to kill the boogeyman. And when he said that, I thought, now, that's pretty tough. Because I used to get in bed and tuck my covers and keep tell the, me and the boogeyman under the bed had, a, had an agreement. If my, my, my feet don't come off the covers, you can't grab me or nothing and pull me under. 
You should be scared. Of I always think something's under the bed. I don't know what it is. Any horror movie that has something under the bed, I can't watch. I'm like, oh, don't look, don't look. But I was sitting there, and the Holy Ghost said, that's the kind of believers I want in the church right now. I'm tired of passive. I'm tired of timid. I, I'm tired of just trying to hide it in a, in a closet and put it up over here in a, new, a room. And take if somebody's possessed by a devil, we want to take them to the demon-possessed room and, and say, here, you can you scream and yell in here. Don't offend all the tithers. And God said, what I need somebody to do is be willing to cast out demons and raise the dead and heal the sick. Freely you've received, freely you give. And he said, and I want people to say about you that you're so tired tough in the kingdom that when they look at you they say no he ain't the devil but if you want to kill the devil he's the one we call I want to be a devil killer see how many want to be a devil killer in this house I want, and I don't want to kill the devil off of my house. I want to be bad enough and powerful enough and anointed enough to come to your house and kill the devil at your house amen, amen. to do this you've got to move past just recognizing God, okay? And so here's the four thing. Here's the four things now. I got you set up. Give me a few minutes to, to land this plane, okay? Language recognition is that we understand the word, the word language. We have to understand that God is the word. John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and God was the word. And I like that. I like that because... It, it really starts setting you up in the New Testament that the Word actually sent the Word, okay? And this is what you understand, that, that the Word, you do, now watch, you, ha, you have no power till you learn how to speak, okay? The only creature on the earth that has words or language is humans. Why are humans the only creature that can put together syllables and sounds and make meaning out of sound? Because we are not something that they try to tell you crawled out of a cesspool. We are created in the image of God. And the proof of that image is communication. Okay? That every, if you took a group of people and threw them on an island, they would learn a language. They would find a way to talk to one another. Because within us is the ability to talk. And we have to understand that when God made man, he formed man, and everything God made when he got to man, well, let me say this, everything God in the beginning created when he got to man, he made. He made man. And when he made man into an image he liked, the key to your power is that he breathed into man, and this breath that he breathed into you was the breath of God, okay? Now, you have to understand something. God doesn't have lungs, okay? God doesn't breathe oxygen, okay? He doesn't exhale unless when he does, something's going to live, okay? And so God just don't go around and talk to everybody. Like everybody, I mean, you have to watch everybody. Oh, God said this, and God said that, and God said this, and God told me that, and God said this. I said, my Lord, God can't keep his mouth shut. You ever heard people like that? I had a person come in one time and said, uh, walked right up to me and, said, and, and pointed, uh, it was years and years ago, pointed to a guy up in the altar and said, God told me in prayer the other night that that's my husband. And I said, the guy sitting right over there, I said, she said, yes, in prayer, God told me. I said, now, God told you that's your husband right there. She said, yeah. I said, now, you think God needs to talk to him? She said, it's a done deal because God talked to me. I said, okay. Two months later, I saw that guy with some other girl. And then they got married, the other girl. I said to the girl, I said, I thought you said that God told you you was going to marry that guy. Here's what she said to me. He did. But the other day in prayer, God came to me and he said, I've changed my mind. <laughs> Do you want a God who changes his mind that he don't know the end from the beginning? See, we're so quick to what we're feeling in our soulless realm, try to put God's word in it or voice on it. And anybody who tries to speak to you prophetically, your first question to them should be, if they're out here in that thing, 
Where do you go to church because you can't be in authority if you're not under authority? Where do you go to church and who's your pastor and do you sit under that authority? And if they say, well, you know, I don't really attend the church. I had somebody tell me this one time. Oh, I just go, go all over because that's how God made me. He made me to go all over. I can receive from every pastor. No, the Bible said I'm under authority, then I'm in authority. They don't want to sit nowhere because they don't want to be corrected. They don't want to be mentored. They don't want to be changed. They don't want to be rebuked. And so we got people that float from church to church, and they're looking for an emotional high. But God's looking for thinkers in the house because thinkers are going to take the last day kingdom back. And language comprehension is the key because language recognition, it says they recognize the language, but they didn't comprehend it. And recognize it means that you appreciate it and that you honor it and that, oh, I like that good sermon or that was some great, that moved me or that stirred me. But that doesn't change you. That doesn't give you power until you move it from recognition into comprehension. And comprehension is when you take the word that is being preached, the Bible, or you're reading it. And you move it from honoring it into making it a seed that you can conceive within yourself. You incubate it in your spirit. That, that, that you embrace it. You get a hold of it. You grab it. Because the word that gets in your spirit, hell cannot rob uh, you of. Anything God covers, hell cannot uncover. So you got a situation over your health. Get the word of God conceived in you about healing, and healing will be your right. It's not your right because I talk about it. It's not your right because you read about it. It's your right when the word becomes comprehended in your spirit. Look, you never say, you and the word got to become one. When you and the word become one, because in that same verse, it said the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is very important you understand this verse. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word became and dwelt among us. And then Jesus said, I'm the firstborn among many so that you cannot do what he did till you become flesh possessed by word. And the word became, you've got to take the word in and have it conquer your flesh. And then you can dwell on the earth with authority. You can call everything that is right yours. You can turn your marriage around. You can turn your ministry around. You can turn the music around. You can turn your mind around when the word gets in your flesh. When I mean flesh, I don't mean your desire, your soul, your will, and your want. I mean in you. The word comprehend means to conceive it. It means that you're, you're, you're eagerly wanting the seed to become impregnated in you. And it's very important. Because if you don't have language comprehension, word comprehension, any crisis will move you away from God. You'll come in here and you'll say, I don't understand it. I'll go to church and I'll cry and I'll weep. And by Tuesday or Friday, I'm in the wrong crowd, smoking the wrong thing. What's wrong with me, God? There's nothing wrong with you. You just got the word in recognition. If you read in the Bible the seeds of the parable of the sower and the sower, it, you're going to see this message to completely when it says, and the seed fell on good soil. Because the seed's out there and there's many hearers. But the, when the seed falls on the good soil, what does the good soil do? It covers it. See, it doesn't let it. it but here's the problem. We can't get good seed into good soil because we can't get the soil to change. And so the good seed will go out, but if you're still wrapped up in bad things and keeping the soil contaminated, then you're part of that parable where the cares of the world or, or it stays out uncovered too long and the sun dries it up. And so you're here, you're eager, you're watching, you're eager, but you can't get blessed, you can't get increased, you can't get joy because you won't become 
better soil. You still letting the cares of the world. You still got division. You can't have word comprehension. Until you get word comprehension, you will not have word application. Language capital, ca- uh, application. It's very important you understand language. Say language. Say it. Language. This is why one of the biggest controversies in the kingdom of God right now in, in, in nominal churches and Pentecostal churches is the word tongues. Speaking in tongues, okay? You, you get around some Baptist folk, talk about tongues, man, they're going to cast the devil out of you. They, they don't believe it. They believe that those gifts, that, that they're in, in, in their great ministries and they got great evangelism, they're just ignorant on this one thing. And they think they have got doctrinal depth, but they don't. Because here's why. They try to take Acts chapter 2 and say that, because that, when we go to, to, the, to the nominal people, we try to use Acts chapter 2 as, as the part of being baptized in the Holy Ghost. However, that is not the, the, the proof of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 2 is the proof of language being restored back to the kingdom. Because the Bible said at the Tower of Babel, everybody spoke one language. Uh, and God said, uh, if I leave them the way they are, speaking one language, the evil which they're doing right now, building a tower and making a city, is not, it says nothing they can't do, they can't imagine, as long as they speak one language. See, when you get one language, the, and, and, every, and here's what scientists, here's what theologians, all theologians believe uh, that the oldest language on the earth is Hebrew, okay, and that when 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 Hebrew became the chosen language of God's chosen people, it was that God is what God probably spoke to Adam was in some kind of Hebrew vernacular, okay. So Hebrew is the oldest language, and one of the oldest languages, and most theologians believe that. And so we have to understand that when God saw all these people, and He was willing to pull out of a nation, and so here's the thing that we don't get: God called them out into their own nation, okay. He didn't come down to them; He called them from them, okay? And that's how you always know it's God. When God is calling you, he doesn't come to you, he calls you from something. He doesn't come to you, he calls you from something. When you hear the voice calling you out, you know it's God. If you hear a voice trying to keep you in, you know it ain't God. He called them out. He said, that will be my people. He picked the ruddiest, the smallest of all nations, and he put division in Language and division, you ought to write this down because here's Satan watched this. Satan saw what God was doing because God was slowing down progress. God was slowing down success. He wasn't going to destroy the people anymore. So he said, I got to do something to keep these people from staying in unity because if they stay in unity, here's what he said. There's nothing they can't do that they can't imagine. Are you with me? Am I, am I going too fast for you? Okay, so we have to understand that God puts division on the earth, and division always creates limitation. And Satan watched what God did to slow down progress, and now he's worked the same thing against us, knowing that if we stay in division in our homes, if we get stay in disunity in our church, if we stay in disunity within God's word, then he can slow down the success process of change. And he did it by messing with the language. Because if people ain't saying it right, they don't understand it, right? And it all starts in the garden. Because when God breathed into Adam, he became a living being. The proof of that was he now had the mind of God and he could comprehend God's language. So he walked in the day with God, and God would come down anytime he wanted. And, and, and people, let, let me help you out. It's not that God left the garden and then come back in the cool of the day. It was that when God opened up communication, because God never leaves any place. He's, he's omnipresent, okay? God didn't leave your house. He's still there. God didn't leave your car. He's still in it. You see, this is why you want to know that anytime you're doing what you ought not to be doing, remember, God ain't not looking. He is always looking. He's omnipresent. But it was when God opened up or started talking. And when God started talking, 
Adam knew how to comprehend it. He had language comprehension. He didn't just have language recognition. So when God would come down, he would talk to Adam, and Adam would come out from wherever he was and start communicating with God anytime God wanted it. See, you don't have to have, watch this, I'm going to blow your theology right here. You don't have to have a set prayer time every day and become so religious that if you miss your prayer time, God's going to be mad at you. If you're kingdom people, God will call you when he wants to talk to you. And wherever you are, in any place when God talks to you you will know the voice the language and it could be a Walmart Target Kmart on a vacation on a boat in a cruise on an island in Jamaica in UK because when God wants to talk to you he ain't waiting for your appointed time for your 10 minute or hour schedule when he knows you're in the kingdom, he'll show up any time. He's got a word to call something out. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. Isn't that good? Because that's what religious folk do. Religious folk, here what religious folk. Man, I be, man, I used to, this is okay if I talk to you. Man, I used to be so burdened over prayer. Man, I think, man, I can't pray hours like them folk can. And I ain't telling you not to do it if you can do it. But some people get down in that prayer. And five days later, they come up. Their beard is grown and their hair is white. Me? I'm rolling 30 minutes like, oh, God, I'm going to hell. I can't stay 30 minutes. Because religion... Beats you into their persuasion. But there is therefore no condemnation in those that are in the anointing of Christ. And I would go to God and say, God, you need to wake up my prayer. Oh, Lord. Oh, God. And then they tell me, I have some preacher tell me, if you get up at 5 a.m., God will meet you there. So here I get rolling out of bed. I felt like Rocky cracked my raw eggs on the. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. I'm going to the prayer room. God's going to be there waiting on me. I'd get there, hit my music. I'd wake up, it's 8 a.m. I went, oh, Lord, would you talking to me? And I fell asleep. Oh, God, don't be mad at me. What's wrong with me? Lord, I'm just not called to preach. And God said, I, I'm not looking for Christians who only schedule me in and then live the rest of their day. I'm looking for kingdom people who I can enter their day at any time. And when I enter, they know to stop for a moment and have a conversation with me. And he said, and let me help you out. I'm God. I don't need two hours to tell you what I need to tell you. You and you need two hours because y'all got to get through all your stories and your rabbit trailing and, and how you felt and what color the hair was. You talked to my mom. You got five hours in one minute conversation. Your daddy and I was walking down the street. the other While I was there, there was a dress in the window. Okay, okay, get back to the story. You ever, you ever talk to people like that? Come on, come on back. Come back. Tell me, tell me. Get, get, come on, I got to go. God said, that's not the, see, the, the numbers 23, 19. God is not a man. God is not a man. God's not going to come down and sit on the, see, we try to make God too human, okay? And, and, and he's going to sit on the couch with you, you know. Hey, give me some Mountain Dew there, y'all. You want pop me some popcorn there, Jerry? I got to talk to you a little bit. Can you turn down TV for a moment? Oh, wait a minute. What are we watching? Oh, you don't want to watch that, God. <laughs> That's how you'd be. Right? You don't want to watch that, God. No, you know, like, well, sit down with me a little bit. You know what? Can I have all night? I need all night with you. I need all night. What I got to talk to you about is all night, man. It's all night. I'm really going through it, man. My church is so anemic. They don't love me. They don't care. That's how we talk one another. Oh, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I feel. God is not going to enter your conversation ever and act like he's had a bad day. First of all, God don't have days. He's God. When God enters, when God's ready to talk to you, if he's going to say something, it's because you've got to do something. And if you don't do it, he ain't talking no more. And some of you have disobeyed God 10 years ago, and what you've heard talking 
hadn't been God because he's not going to tell you to do anything beyond the last thing he already told you to do. That hurt. Keep it coming, huh? And so you're going to God over an issue that he told you already how to solve it. And you call it prayer. But if you had word comprehension, language, if you understood the power of language, the power of talking God's talk, not your feelings. You don't want to talk your feelings. You want to talk your faith to God. You want to talk your dreams to God. You don't want to keep coming to God and reminding him. See, because here's another religious thing. We come to God and we spend 30 minutes to an hour telling him how sorry we are and how sick we are and how we're so messed up and you made me this way and I'm sorry I failed and I'm sorry I did this. And God said, don't be sorry because I don't make sorry. Sorry things. He said, if you did it, it was a decision. Get over it. Get beyond it. Why? Because I am an all forgiven God, slow to anger and quick to forgive. I don't want to talk about your mistakes. I don't want to talk about your failure. I want to talk about your greatness. I want to talk about that the reason hell didn't kill you, that drug didn't kill you, that car wreck didn't kill you, is because I still got purpose and destiny and power in you this is scriptural the, they, the Bible said he came to his own and his own did not comprehend him they would not receive him you go to church to be trained the word not up your emotions it, this is not we're not the gathering of the monster club Taking an energy drink in our spirit work. Gotta go to church, man. I heard somebody sometimes. I gotta go to church, man. My spirit needs some, needs some like Red Bull. My body needs Red Bull. My spirit needs some Red Bull. Your spirit don't need Red Bull. Your spirit needs to be released. It needs to be released by the word comprehension. That yes, there's crisis. Yes, there's struggle. Yes, there's loss. Right now, we're going through family crisis with my children and, and with one of my ch child that's out there. But it doesn't stop me from praising. It doesn't stop me from sowing. It doesn't stop me from reading the word. It doesn't change how I feel. It doesn't change my praise. It doesn't change my focus. Why? Because I know that if I put my faith in him, I can. Listen, I know it hurts right now. It's hurting in me right now. I know. This is for somebody. Forget all the religious folk in here. It is for somebody right now I want to tell you something I know it hurts I know you're under a heavy burden but you can praise God on credit right now because your God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can think or ask and you ought to just throw your hands up and say God I'm going to praise you on credit it ain't all good but it's going to be all good Division creates limitations. There's no division when there's word comprehension. There's only agreement. Is this too deep? Well, Bishop, what are you trying to tell us? I'm getting there. Some of you come from this church. Some of you come from that church. I'm, we're in Hickory. Hickory is a, a smorgasbord of church travelers. We're church merchants. We're not word merchants. We're church merchants. We're, 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 we're preacher mer we, We're just looking for somebody to tell us we okay. That's not going to get you your blessing. You need somebody to tell you where you're not okay. Amen? Right, Ashley? I don't want a man of God to come up and tell me where I'm all okay. First of all, if I go to the doctor... Okay, I had a I had a mucus cyst on my lip that kept it just bothered me. I kept biting it. I I had a I called and, and I got on Google and I started looking up, you know, and Google scared the hell out of you. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> Your lips gonna fall off. I'm like, oh my God, I don't want that page. But what I was looking for is who do you go see? And some cause this person said, go see the dentist. That person over there said, go see your general practitioner. I even hate that word. I hate to pay a guy practicing on me. <laughs> then 
Somebody said, go see this. And I said, no, I don't want to go see this guy, that guy. And this guy, this guy says, oh, you know what? You need to go over and see that guy. And then that guy says, you know what? You need to see this specialist. I just go to the specialist. And they say, well, it costs more. Pay up front, baby. Pay up front. I'm worth it. I go to the dermatologist. Okay? And now, I go in the office. And first of all, I tell the lady when I put my appointment, I say, listen, I'm very impatient. Don't book me. If I got to sit out there and wait an hour to go in a little room to wait another hour for him to run in and tap me on the back. <laughs> I heard one lady say, well, he's a doctor. His time is valuable. I said, well, I'm a man of God. My time's more yeah. valuable. She said, oh, I'll put you in right away. <laughs> and so I go to the doctor. He, and he comes in. He goes, what's your problem? Now, if I'm like you religious folk, I don't want to tell you my real problem. <laughs> So I'm going to say, well, you know, my back hurt a little bit the other day, and my foot's over there. No, I went in there, and I just pulled my lip down and said, you see that? That's my problem. I keep biting it. He puts on this thing. He looks at it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was like one of them cysts. I said, yeah, I know what it is. I didn't come here to know what it is. I want to know what you're going to do about it. He said, and this is what he said to me. Well, what you want me to do? And right then, I knew this man's biblical. Why? Because Jesus always asked, what do you want? You know why some of you ain't got blessed yet? Because you're so religious, you don't know how to just stop all your bull for a little bit and just say, here's what I really want. I want to be blessed. I want to be healed. That's what I really want. I want to get up and get in my future. I'm tired of living in my past. I said, I'll tell you what I want. I want you to do whatever you got to do to get rid of it. And I don't mean six months. I mean immediately. He said, I can take that needle right there and shoot you with this numbing thing, and I can cut it out. I held it down. I said, I'll hold it. You get to cut it. <laughs> and within 10 minutes, I was resolved. Why am I telling you that? Because when you know why you're there, why him haul about why you're here? Pull your lip down and show God. Say, look, I'm really here. Cut this out of my life, please. Or did you see that right there? Get that off my back. And you see that? I did it, and I'm addicted to it. I'm tired of being addicted to it. And I came here not to feel good about it. I came here to become unaddicted to it. And I heard that there's a God in heaven that is bigger than addiction and bigger than cancer and bigger than divorce. And I came here, and I'm tired of just going through all this fluff. I need to comprehend your word. I want to go home and be a a better husband. I want to be a better father. I want to be a better mother. I want to be a better businessman. I want to please a king. I want to walk in the kingdom. I want to get involved. Some of you just come to church week after week and you don't do a cotton picking thing. Well, I love that preaching. Word recognition. Bishop had a good word today. April, Bishop, I watched him online. He had a good word today. Language recognition. Oh, man. Oh, I felt the Lord at the favor center today. Language recognition. The question is language comprehension. What did God tell you to do? And are you doing it? Because if you ain't, you can't have application. You can't apply what I'm talking. And you know, I'm getting ready to close. I got 10 minutes and you're out of here. You know how I know you've obeyed it. You know how I know you've comprehended it. Let me tell you how I know. You know how I know when I'm obeying the word, Marianne? I'll tell you how I know. You know the pr before application will come opposition. And here's what God said to me. How am I going to use you as an example if you can't point to things you survived? You have no idea why you survived what you survived because you have no idea who you're going to help. You don't know the thousands of Elijah's in a cave. I'm all by myself. I'm all alone. I, I don't know what to do. I'm all alone. God, I'm the only one left. That I mean, how self-righteous is that? I'm the only one left that still loves you. I'm the only one left. And God said, come up out of that cave. I got 7,000 over here waiting on you. You ain't the only one. But as long as you stay in that cave, you will be the only one. 
And you'll die in that cave. Because when you let the devil's crisis drive you in a cave, all you're going to get in your life is tunnel vision. You're only going to see what's at the foot of that cave. And there's a whole world of blessing waiting on somebody. Come out the cave. When you get language, comprehension, and you start comprehending, and that means you can see what's being preached, and it incubates in you, hostility comes in. You know, uh, hostility to what, Bishop? You become hostile to the wicked. You become angry over sin. You become hostile to people who don't love your king. When I mean hostile, I don't mean being mean to them. I mean something in you drives you away from them. You can't hang with. Listen, if you say you've changed, but go back and hang with the same friends, and when you got in their presence, they didn't change, it's the proof you didn't change. Because if you changed in the kingdom and you got around your old friends, you would either convict them to change or you would change them as your friends. Is that truth or not? I mean, you come out of some stuff, didn't you, Brandy? Drugs and I don't even know if you want to talk about it, but you came out of some stuff, didn't you? You had a 20-year prison sentence. 20-year prison sentence. How old were you? 18, you were 18? Give her a mic. I want to hear her testimony. I don't care about time. I, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll end on time. I don't care about changing where we're at. I want to hear her testimony for a minute. Tell me, you were what now, 18? Yeah, I was 18 and I was pregnant. You were seven months pregnant, 18, facing a... And so you got rested? Yes, oh yes. So they didn't care you was pregnant, didn't they? Oh no. Well, hell don't care. And then what happened? I'm just glad that God don't judge you like man judges you. 20-year prison sentence, 18 years old, pregnant, seven months pregnant, 50 years. But she went to church. And that's something, something now what drove you to church? I mean, did you know about church? Oh, so somebody told you? So wait a minute, How, how'd you get there? Somebody invited you, say so took you, huh? How'd you get there again? I just want these people to hear how you got there. My friend. Somebody told you about it. You weren't looking for it, but God sent somebody looking for you. So somebody in your life had word comprehension. It became the word of God to you. They saved her life. But here's her God where everybody else was judging her and everybody else had arrested her and everybody else said she I guarantee you people talked about her behind her back look at that 18 year old girl living like that God said well that's what they say about her but God he turned it all to the angels and he said you don't listen to them that's not what I say about I call her delivered. I call her healed. Was you addicted to drugs or anything? I used to smoke weed a little bit. That weed always shows up. You turned that weed to seed, didn't you? <laughs> weed is becoming the most deadliest demonic drug, and here's why. Because now all the world wants to tell you, oh, it ain't that bad. When they use the word ain't that bad, that means there's something bad to it. Brandy, you're a miracle. The God of heaven. Amen. Love. Go ahead.
Isn't it funny? God blesses us. We get back, caught back up into the goodness of God and forget Him in it. And then we fall again. Some of you are living a repeated cycle because you just won't quit becoming individualistic in the kingdom. Let me tell you something. I, I, I love that because my daughter's eight. Well, how old is Jordan right now? She's 20, but 18. My daughter's going to sit there. My daughter's going to sit right there with me and have that same testimony. And I'm going to tell you why. Because if God will do it for Brandy, he'll do it for Jordan. He'll do it for Jerry. He'll do it for Joe. He'll do it for Linda. He'll do it for April. He'll do it for Dennis. He'll do it for Bob. He'll do it for Greg. He'll do it for April. Judy, he'll do it. Roland, he'll do it. How many, how many years was you in a prison sentence? But God's got you in the house, ushering. God, we call in the hurting from the north, the south, the east, and the west. God, this is a restoration, God, we serve. God, there's so many that are sitting in the gutter right now with purpose burning inside of them. And the religious don't know how to talk to them. But King Jesus does. And God, I pray right now that you'll begin to work on us that know you. Somebody would pray that with me right now. God, work on us that knows you. I don't want to judge nobody. I don't want to, I don't want to be unforgiving. I, I, I want to forgive. Look up here. Here's, here's why unity is so powerful. I may not have it all together. But when we come in here, we together can have it all. That's why hell don't want us hooked up. That's why Matthew chapter 18, Jesus said, if two of you agree on anything, it'll be done. He said this, I'll be in the midst of you. We'll come back and talk about this because I want to show you the, the one thing that's keeping you from language comprehension. If you ain't getting delivered from something that's in your past, here's why. One word. You go home on this one word. You haven't forgiven something. Unforgiveness is a cancer that keeps you from comprehending God's word because his word comes in one capsule, love. When God sends the word, he'll embrace it in the capsule of love. And love cannot enter a house that has unforgiveness on the door. And so if I preach in a way that you haven't forgiven a dad, a mom, a past, a life, a teacher, a professor, someone who molested you, a father that may have molested you, a, a grandfather, an uncle, or I was molested from a church leader, the, uh, the same person that was trying to go in my house and do Bible study for four years in my mom and daddy's house was molesting me behind their back from 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. And then, and then it stopped. But the torment continued. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, until my 30s, until I learned how to get forgiveness of it and forgive myself and I didn't do anything. Am I helping anybody? If you read Matthew 18 as your devotion this week, you read Matthew 18 and 19. Right after he gets talking about unity, he'll talk to you about agreement and tell you, I'll be in the midst of everybody. That's unity. That's together. That's why the hell don't want the gathering. That's why he's going to keep you late at work on Wednesday. That's why he's going to over, overdo you on, on Saturday night. That's why you're going to get nauseous. He's going to do everything he can to keep you out of the gathering. Why? Because you might not have it all together individually, but if you ever come into his house in unity, together we can have it all. Because now we, we help one another's weaknesses become strengths, right? But I want to send you home on this. Take up our offer and go home. If you have unforgiveness in any area of your life, 
anywhere. Over a spouse. Over there's somebody watching right now. You can't fully commit to your spouse because you keep turning up the volume of yesterday's failure in them. They wounded you. They hurt you. When you're mad, you say some hateful things in marriage, don't we? Hateful. Don't we, Marianne? Whoo, hateful. When we're frustrated, words come out. But see, if I knew how to hold my power, I wouldn't say those words to something I love. Because I love Marianne more than anything on the earth besides God. I love her. I love her more than I love my kids. She loves her kids more than me, but that's okay. <laughs> She's a mother. Most mamas do. I didn't carry them, but she did. I didn't feel them moving in me, she did. See, I understand the sowing part. She understands the reaping part. That's how the house should work. I cover her, she covers them. Amen? If you have unforgiveness in any area, and you don't give it to God right now, and, and, and I don't care, maybe somebody's watching, you got such an unforgiveness towards your father. I don't know who you are. Tears are starting to well up in the bottom of your eye. I can see you there right now. You feel betrayed. You feel, dis you feel distrust. You feel pain when you think about it. But God said until you forgive, I can't give you comprehension in that area of your life. You're asking no more. How many got some unforgiveness to deal with right now? I just feel like we need to do it right now. Father, we, if you got some unforgiveness, just stand to your feet. You ain't got to come to the altar, but just stand to your feet. I want anybody around you that, that has dealt with, uh, you feel good about yourself, and you've given God all areas. I want you just to reach over and touch the back. And if they're behind you, reach back and grab their hand for a moment. We're going to pray body language. If you got unforgiveness in any area of your life, uh, just for quickly, briefly, before we take up our seat. If there's unforgiveness, there's three back here we need some people to lay hands on. Go find somebody. You can move from your seat just for a moment. We body church, man. We them people watching online, they, they crying, wishing they had somebody lay hands on them. <laughs> Why? Because when we come back and talk about this forgiveness and unforgiveness and teach the kingdom, the kingdom love. Say this, the kingdom walks in love. Say this, the kingdom walks in love. You can get up and go to somebody if you need to. Well, there's a restoring right there. Father and his son hugging one another. Ron, go over and pray for Greg and Ryan. Woo! Breath of God, breath of God, breath of God. Blow in this place, breath of God. Blow mighty breath of God, life, come on. We're praying for them right now, pray for them. Anybody got unforgiveness in any area of your life? Unforgiveness over, uh, some of you need to forgive life. You need to just forgive life. If you haven't forgiven life, forgive it. Because it's hard, it's, it's easy to blame life, ain't it, Brandy? If you got unforgiveness in any area, we're going to sing just one time. Blow, mighty breath of God, blow. Let the wind blow in this place. Mighty breath. If you're watching on the internet, the word of God's coming through the airways right now. Might be replay. The breath of God's coming. It's not limited by time nor space. It's coming through these cameras. The UK, Wales. Liberia, I know church in Liberia, Favor Center, Liberia, both churches. God's come and let, forg let walk in forgiveness, walk in the love of God, walk in His power. Move. Oh, yeah, say that one more time. Say that one more time. Blow. That's his, that's his language, man. When he blows, something lives. When he blows, something grows. When he blows, when he blows, when he speaks, something changes. Blow. I receive it. Mighty. Ooh, I receive it. One more time. Mighty breath of God. Somebody shout. Move upon this country, Lord, America. Blow in America, God. Mighty breath. 
Sing it, Jeremy! Sing it! One more time! One more time! One more time! One more time! Let your wind blow! Mighty breath of God! your wind blow. Let your wind blow. God, they heard the sound of a rushing mighty wind and you began to talk to the earth again, Lord, in Acts chapter 2. And each man heard their own language spoken of the marvelous things the Lord of heaven is going to do in your house. I want you to say everything that's hurting me is blowing away right now. Say it. Make a profession of it. Say everything that's tried to wound me, tried to destroy me. If you're watching, say it. Anything that's tried to beat me down, God's blowing it away like a hurricane. And the same breath that's blowing away my trouble is blowing my healing in it. There's healing in his wings. Amen. God, I pray now everybody be touched. Father, we love you today. God, we're getting ready to take up our offering. We believe that offering, seed, is at the end. The Bible said tithe and offering. The reason why we do that, you can sow online, you can sow here. There's an envelope in front of you. You can sit down for a moment. Under this anointing, under this power, you give an offering above your tithe. We don't put this in our pocket. This ain't going into boats and cars. This is going into the kingdom of God. This is going towards projects. This is going towards what we're doing. And let me help you out. All these cameras and all this TV, none of this expense is on this church budget. I pay for every bit of this out of my own budget, out of my own expense. When I sell books and travel, I pay for all of the outreach ministry in this church through these cameras. Millions are watching. And not one dollar comes on the budget of this house that you, somebody said to me, how can you have a size of your church and do what you're doing? Because I put what I've had in the hand of God. And I trusted him, not man, not religion. I read Luke 6.38 one day. Give and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and run it over. And the Holy Ghost said to me, it is anything I gave. And here we uh, nominal church tried to tell me it's not true. My denomination I was attending, similar God told me that's not true, that you can't give and expect something from God. But that scripture says, give and it will be given to you good measure. It will be given back to you. Whatever you give, it is whatever you let go of. He said, I'll give it back to you good measure, press down, shake it together, run it over. Then he said, would I have men... Give it back to you. God said, I'll have your enemy start favoring you. And I got a hold of that verse, Marianne, and I believed it. And I started taking the little we had. Didn't have much, did we, baby? $5 and $10 and said, this is above my tithe, Lord. But if Luke, if John 3, 16 is what I've based my salvation on and Luke is in the same Bible, why can't I bake my finances on Luke 6, 38? I tie my heart and my soul and my family to... John 3, 16, and I tie my wealth and my finances to Luke 6, 38. And I put my faith around it and put expectation to it. And I said, I ain't expecting man to do it. I'm expecting my king to bring it back to me. And slowly but surely, God began to bless. Same thing with you, wasn't it, Jeremy? 
you. You start where you are. Look at somebody say, don't get upset. Start where you're at and see what God can bring you to. He's going to bring you to somewhere greater than where you are. I trust you. Trust me. Everything I have is because I learned that 1638. I give to God. I go to churches and give. I, I, I so I would probably, we were the top giver in the church this year. Hallelujah. Ooh, and that's just here, Brandy. I'm, we sow all over. But I made God my wealth mantle. Not my job, not my mind, my God. How many want to make God their wealth mantle? Put your offering in. Put your seed. Now, we sow, we're sow. we sowing right now because it was just a scripture God gave me, Psalm 65, 11. And I've got so many people sowing this $65.11 seed all over TV, all over the Internet. And they're writing me the most craziest, quick miracles. Uh, someone in the church here, I won't say their name because they didn't give me permission to, but said that they struggled with tithe and ended up sowing their tithe, started paying their tithe and did a Psalm 65, 11. And the job they attended said, don't, told me they ain't never going to get a pay raise. And they got the pay raise within the next 24 to 48 hours. They got a pay raise that they never thought they would get and didn't have to go work the second job or quit the job. All because they attached this. You will crown your year with favor that your past will be dripping with abundance. It's dripping with abundance. Why? So that the little hills in the wilderness sees you coming and you drip it on the hurting and you drip it. It's not to get another house. You're not getting prosperity. Go buy another car. That's not your focus. Uh, Your focus is to drip on the path, drip in the wilderness so the little hills will shout for joy when they see you coming because they know you're dripping abundance in their marriage, their wilderness, their heart, their lives. Amen? Amen. How many believe that's going to happen for you right now? All right, write it to Favor Center and to stand to your feet. Let me, Lord, I pray for every seed. I want those that are watching. We love you. We're so glad you're a part of our I church. The Holy Ghost is moving. We're just kind of moving with the river. We're experiencing new flows and new touches, and we want you to be a part of it too. And we love you, and we're so glad you're a part of it. Now, look, some of you can lay your seed in the altar or on the way out. There'll be an usher there with a giving uh, a pail bucket, offering plate, whatever you want to call it. You can put it in that. But hug somebody and sow the seed of love and fellowship so that God will give you the harvest of relationship. Talk to you later all around the world. I want you to know there's no life like a favored life. Get ready. Favor's coming to your church. Take us away, Jeremy.